Hi everyone, welcome for joining us at the third Community Land Trust Roundtable. Um, this week we are going to be talking about islands. Um, we're joined with by Sandy Bishop, who is the Executive Director of Lopez CLT in the US, and Philippe Jordi, who is the Island Housing Executive Director and in of Martha's Vineyard in the in Massachusetts. So uh, my name is Natasha Holst and I will be hosting the event today. Um, I am Schumacher Center's uh, Community Land Trust. Um, uh, sorry, <laughs> I am Natasha Holst. So I am the program director for the European Land Commons program at the Schumacher Center. And um, I also I'm based in Amsterdam in Europe, and I uh, we recently also uh, started a community land trust in um, in the Netherlands called Grond van der Staan. Um, when we were talking and preparing this recently, we spoke with Sandy Bishop and Philippe uh, Jordi, uh, and one of the things that Sandy said that really struck me was that community land trusts are one of the um, best kept secrets and I think what we're trying to do here as well is to raise awareness of the possibilities of community land trusts and also to offer um, yeah information and also other things to uh, to people who would like to start a community land trust um, and well, we have with Sandy and Philippe, we have, uh, who both have more than 30 years of experience with community land trust. Um, we have a really unique perspective on the, um, on an island situation. I think that an island is very much a microcosm of, uh, and, and really shows a lot of the social and ecological problems that you have uh, in a larger society. So, um, in that way, I think the way that Sandy and Philippe have dealt with these issues on the islands are also show a lot of possibilities for how um, we can deal with uh, social and ecological issues in larger society. I think also that um, with um, with it's also one of the reasons why we're doing this community land trust roundtable is because it was uh, inspired. Uh, by the work that Schumacher Center has been doing for the last 40 years, starting with Bob Swan and um, the Community Land Trust movement in the 1960s. Um, and of course, together, Bob Swan was also the founder of Schumacher Center and together with um, the other Slater King and others who started the Schumacher, uh, sorry, started the uh, Community Land Trust movement. Um, this is what the Schumacher Center has been working for for the last 40 years. And one of the way uh, that uh, George Monbiot was able to really bring together in his uh, 40th Schumacher lecture, um, he was really able to show the context of land being so important for social and ecological issues. So that inspired us to start off this Community Land Trust Roundtables and to have different um, vantage points. So today we'll be starting with the uh, island vantage point and asking Sandy to introduce herself and also tell us a little bit more about Lopez Island and uh, the work that you've been doing there. Welcome, Sandy. Oh, you're on mute. Always the thing, isn't it? The mute. Uh, anyway, I've been a long admirer of the Schumacher Institute. So thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for the introduction. And I thought I would start, I'll share my screen and go through a series of slides. And, um, you know, we can just uh, talk along the way. So hello, everybody. I'm Sandy Bishop. And um, as Natasha mentioned, I live on Lopez Island. Uh, we're in the San Juans. So we're in the state of Washington, up north of Seattle, near Vancouver Island, BC. 
And there are four community land trusts operating within the island uh, San Juan um, County here. Uh, there's one on Orcas, one on San Juan, a small one on Waldron, and then ours. Uh, so we established ourselves in uh, 1989. And, uh, you know, when we started this, we really looked at how we could respond to the changes on a small, small island. And we have population of around 2,600. Of course, that swells. You can see uh, on the map there, we're close to Seattle. Uh, especially during the pandemic, uh, the islands became the place to go, were pastoral, attractive to bicyclists. Um, yeah, there's a couple thousand housing units for a 26 year round uh, residency. And a little over half are occupied year round, a little less than half seasonally occupied. Depending on your neighborhood and where you live on the islands, it's between four and 8% of vacation rentals. And I don't know if you've looked at what goes on in neighborhoods that have more than 4% uh, vacation rentals, but, but they really consider that to be disruptive to a neighborhood. 3% uh, of the homes on the island are CLT homes. So you can see we don't, we don't really keep up uh, with what's going on around here. Our wages are the second lowest in the state. Uh, average cost of a home is really out of reach. Um, we have 1.2 residents for every housing unit that there is. So there really isn't a shortage of houses on the island. It's really a shortage of affordable homes. And I think that's a really important point because at some point you ask yourself, can we really build our way out of this imbalance here? Um, I would love to have a longer discussion of that, you know, globally, nationally, locally, et cetera. Uh, so we've got this high per capita income and low wages. Uh, on Lopez, we started about 32 years ago. And one of the first things a banker said to us is, you know, it's a great idea. We'd really like to be your mortgage lender, but uh, all the people that you want to serve are not what we call bankable. So she suggested to us, why don't you try limited equity co-ops? That way we're loaning to a co-op and not the individuals. So we have been for the last 32 years doing limited equity co-ops. We also do rentals and then we have a, some agricultural um, lands and farms. I really like and appreciate and respect the uh, thinking that went into community land trusts in the beginning. And I have a special appreciation for the rural nature of the first community land trust. I really like that it is grounded in Gandhian land reform and civil rights. Um, uh, there are you know, over 300 in the US right now. And, and as Natasha mentioned in the beginning, there are also uh, sprouting up globally. I can see that the people who engage in our co-ops and in the CLTs are, are better functioning in a democracy than your average homeowner. That's, that's just what I've, what I've noticed. Um, I have this, Oh, I don't know, I'm a, a, a little bit um, of a rebel in some ways because we're always being asked to justify why we need to have affordable housing on this island. And so we're forced to say, okay, well, do you notice your EMTs and the teachers and, and you know, all of these people live in affordable housing. And in some ways that's a crazy making thing because I mean, aren't we all worthy of housing regardless of our occupation? But nonetheless, you know, we, we do, um, you know, we do state who lives in our houses. We've housed 12% of the Lopez school kids. Um, Lopez Island and all the San Juans are basically a white population. 20% uh, of the people that 
are in CLT housing identify as Black, Indigenous, people of color. Uh, there's a wide range of ages and and you know what people do from mm, probably about 40% own their own business. Um, some work, some are retired. Um, you know, there's just a whole variety. So we live on an island and it is an absolutely beautiful environment. And we based our houses on kind of some, some traditional housing models, but, but we also integrated into them, you know, being net zero, uh, local materials and, and a lot of um, solar. Uh, solar hot water, uh, passive solar, solar electric. Um, we have been trying to put more more land in uh, banking for housing. Um, we started building, we started in 1989, but built the first seven houses in 1992. It's called the Morgantown Co-op. Um, we continued building. Uh, there's Coho and Innisfree. These are all co-ops. Uh, Common Ground was actually the first co-op that we did, which was uh, net zero. So meaning that it produces as much energy as, as a household uses. Now you can build a net zero house, but it doesn't mean there's a net zero family going to live there. So some of the households make net zero and others do not. But, but nonetheless, they're set up so that they can. Uh, the next co-op we did was um, called Tierra Verde and then uh, Salish Way. One of the things that we do, we live on an island. We come from a very, very strong owner-builder um, culture here in the Northwest. And so we have found for these last 32 years that engaging the lower income people that, that build with us if they build their house from the ground up, from the foundation up, they are much better prepared to caretake it uh, for the long run. And so we, we have volunteers, interns, homeowners, and paid um, contractors and construction uh, crew all working together to build houses. We typically, the land trust typically serves as its own contractor. Uh, so depending on what the insurance industry is doing, we're either allowed to do that or not. And uh, we do consider the sustainability in all of our programs, sustainability, resiliency. Um, we tend to build on the small side. Um, like I said, we try for net zero, meaning that we, you know, solar hot waters uh, or heat pump technology, rainwater catchment, grid tied solar. We built with straw bale. We use high efficiency windows, insulated shades, uh, really try and, um, you know, use products that make for healthy air inside of a home. There's a lot of reasons to do this. Uh, some of it is because the pressures of, of just resource consumption and climate change. And another is, is because really when you think of the operational side of, of a house, a lot goes into, yes, your mortgage interest insurance payment, but just operating your house can be quite expensive. And so if you get those costs to a minimal, uh, people have you know, more ability to, uh, maintain a healthy economic uh, lifestyle. So we've also um, worked on farm initiatives. We're really interested, well, we live on an island, only about, oh, I'd say half of 1%, maybe 1% of our food grown uh, supports the, the local people here. Much of it is imported and food security and housing kind of go hand in hand. So we have started what we call the sustainable ag and rural development part of our uh, program too. And so we focus on housing and SARD. We publish a farm guide. We've published a book on local farms and community, co-founded the uh, farm to school program at the, at the local school, established a mobile slaughter unit uh, this is the first one where the USDA actually approved it. And what it does is it comes to the farm rather than hauling animals 
as far away as Montana, you know, a couple of days uh, drive just to get your animals out. And then it makes it available for the local, um, local purchasers. We've also got a seed library and uh, we operate a grain CSA, which is basically community supported agriculture, but, but this is grain specific. So we've uh, introduced a variety of uh, winter wheat that is really well suited to the Northwest. Um, we've got about 91 acres of farmland, uh, two farms are Stonecrest and then uh, Lopez Sound Road. And this is part of, again, of our food security I um, want to put out a little bit about the finances here. You can see on both of these uh, charts, there are about 20% of our capital pro projects are funded through public funds. The majority is private. And in our operations, we don't get public funds for, for operating. We, you know, about... 43% is through an endowment, lease fees, rents, uh, programs, that type of thing. And then the rest we have to raise um, annually, you know, through private foundations and, and donors. I don't know what I think about that really. It's, it's stressful, uh, but I'm, I'm not sure public funds are the answer, but it would be nice, I think, and, and I think all, CLTs deal with this to one degree or another. Um, we have to find we have a 200 year commitment to lands, people, community, and we have to find ways to sustain ourselves. And so I know money isn't everything, but it's a big, a big part of what we need to do. Recently, San Juan County created a real estate excise tax. Um, we're the only county of 39 in the state of Washington that has this, one half of 1% goes to a home fund. <clears throat> it was estimated to be about $1.2 million annually. And you know, when you're building houses, that's not very much, but it's better than, than nothing, which is what it was before. Uh, pandemic buying last year actually boosted that fund uh, to over $2 million. Uh, there's, there's a housing trust fund that the state operates, and then we get some self-help um, housing um, funds that are federal distributed through, through HUD. So that's really a breakdown of where the public funds come. We've got about oh, four employees, three full-time uh, equivalent, and about 10% of our membership uh, 10% of our local population are, are members, either leaseholders or, or general. And of course, we operate with the traditional tripartite board that most community land trusts uh, operate with. Um, after one of the housing groups that we finished, the co-ops, one of the things that they did is they got together afterwards and just spoke out what it was like to be together, to be building together. And this quote from Meg Wheatley summed it up. There's no power for change greater than the community discovering what it cares about. And one thing about people building houses together, it breaks down a lot of the natural tension that we found um, between, uh, you know, uh, ages, uh, races, cultures, etc. Because when you are helping each other build your house and eating together every day, and and uh, you know just basically looking out for one another, um, there are bonds that take place that are really worthwhile, especially when you are setting up uh, housing co-ops where people are going to be in a business relationship with each other and in trust and understanding what each other means is part of running a, a really good uh, professional co-op. Um, I think I will stop there and I hear there's gonna be questions and answers later. So we can do that. And uh, next will be Philippe, thank you.
Thank you very much, Sandy. It looks like a wonderful place to live. Um, when Philip's getting his slides ready, uh, I think, yeah. Okay, great. All right. Well, thank you, Natasha, and thank you, Sandy. That was, um, I think there are a lot of parallels between our islands. Um, the Island Housing Trust, I'm the uh, founding director of, um, is, uh, is newer than, than Lopez, but in many ways has um, similarities that um, we share. And uh, we, cr we created this, our community land trust back in 2006. Um, and it was really a direct result of the pressure that was being exerted on the island in terms of the lack of affordable housing. Um, we have our island, which is off of the Cape, uh, Cape Cod here in Massachusetts, is approximately 100 square miles, six small towns on one island. And um, we have approximately 18,000 year round residents in the summer that balloons to probably close to 100,000. And we as well have as many homes as we have year round residents. So we have approximately uh, 17 or 18,000 homes here on the island. But um, approximately 65% of those homes are seasonal and actually are shrinking. Over the past 10 years, uh, we lost 600 year round homes um, to seasonal uh, owners and, and investment property owners. Um, we have created. Um, since 2006, approximately 122 homes, ownership and rental, serving over 300 island residents and their families. Let's see if I can get, uh, there we go. We have a, um, we have a board of uh, 13 um, who are representative of, of the island, the diversity here in terms of towns, in terms of, um, ethnicity in terms of um, occupation. Um, and we have um, a staff of 10 now, which has grown. Uh, it's doubled over the past five years, as has our housing production. And a um, robust uh, committees. And we have six different committees with over 20 members who, um, who work with our staff to provide recommendation and, and um, and direction in terms of the organization as a whole. Um, we have seen an increase in competition um, because of the seasonal rental market here on the island. So for us at this point, it's not even a question of affordability, it's a question of availability. There's just no rental housing, uh, especially year round here on the island. Um, and we're being pressured uh, by not just people who want to own a home here um, from the region, but internationally. We have people from all over the world who are attracted to the, our island. Right now, we, um, we're seeing approximately 10% of our housing stock um, that is being used for short-term rentals. So during the season, people who are averaging, what, $3,000 uh, a month in rents and the affordability that we, we're experiencing, the affordability gap that is in terms of what people can um, afford to purchase and what, they, um, what we have here on the market in terms of, of median household prices, there's a gap of approximately $800,000. We right now have a median home price of over a million dollars, $1.1 million for a, um, median home here on the island. And that has increased dramatically, um, probably between 15 and 20% just in the past year alone. Um, because of COVID, people have been attracted to um, the island um, for the many reasons that people come here anyway, but uh, especially so as uh, they've left a lot of uh, the urban centers. So we're, we're finding increased pressure um, meanwhile, those who live on the island, as, as Sandy was mentioning, are not high earning uh, wage earners. So 41% of our homeowners 
uh, here on the island earn low and moderate incomes of $71,000, $72,000 or less in household income, combined household income um, annually. We are a community land trust and um, we utilize the model, the ground lease model, because um, we felt that it was important in terms of retaining uh, the community's investment in the properties that we create here on the island um, in terms of home ownership. So uh, this is an example of a home that was given to us that we did a deep energy retrofit, which means we, we took a, an older building and we um, did uh, increase the insulation um, and air tightness and um, mechanicals so that it was um, much more energy efficient and sold that home on land that we leased. And their 99 year leases, it's the traditional uh, CLT ground lease model that we use that's accepted by all our, our banks in terms of leasehold mortgages and is recognized by Fannie Mae. So our homeowners um, are able to secure very competitive um, mortgages and um, that has been, um, we've probably close to 75 homes right now that are owned uh, on ground lease land. So certainly something that has been um, very important, but over the past, well, almost 10 years now, since the last recession, our focus has been shifting to, oops, shifting over to rental properties. Um, and we've had to really come up with more creative solutions and designs in order to be able to make sense of a very, very challenging environment in terms of the real estate market here. So what we've started to do and what we've had some success with is partnering, um, partnering specifically with our local jurisdictions, the towns that we uh, work with and the local nonprofits, as well as property owners um, to look at how we can um, make sense of creating this balance between natural environment and the human environment here on the island. We've looked at um, innovative housing models um, in order to expand um, opportunities here on the island. And then really looking at how we can leverage um, capital, uh, specifically social impact investments in a way that um, can help us increase our housing production. This is an example of a partnership with our local hospital, where we purchased uh, an, an existing inn. Uh, it was a 16 bedroom inn and we converted it into shared housing. So a different housing model for us than what we had done before, which was pretty much exclusively single family houses and, and uh, rental apartments and created this uh, shared housing uh, model. And um, we entered into a master lease with our hospital who now are able to provide year-round housing to their lower wage employees, many of whom, like CNAs and technicians and so forth, were commuting um, on the ferry every day to get to work. Um, when the ferry ran <laughs> in the wintertime, we oftentimes find the um, interruptions in terms of uh, you know, those basic um, types of, of uh, modes of transportation. So this has provided the hospital with, um, and their employees with greater certainty in terms of year-round housing. We recently did the renovation of another um, inn. This was an eight bedroom inn, we created uh, seven apartments. And again, providing some in-town housing solutions um, from a pre-existing building. It's actually over a hundred years old. Um, so, this was a way for us to work with a, a property owner who sold us this property at a discount. Um, we were able to afford him some tax benefits because of our, our uh, nonprofit charitable status and uh, made, uh, made this possible at, at a price that actually is more competitive than building new. One of the other areas that we've been innovating is really working with our land conservation organization here on the island. It's a public entity um, that enjoys a real estate transfer fee for every property that is sold. They receive 2% of the sale price. So their revenues are uh, about uh, well, 15 million, and certainly this year more, 
um, which they then use to purchase properties and in some cases, conservation restrictions. So as you see in this image here, the red represents the property boundary for an approximately 15 acre piece of property that we purchased. And then we sold the back 10 acres uh, in the form of conservation restrictions to our uh, local land um, conservation organization. And we split the purchase price. It was a $1.2 million purchase. We each paid $600,000. And then we will be building, in fact, we're just about to break ground on 20 rental apartments clustered in this, what we like to call pocket neighborhood um, near the road. So closer to public transportation and services. And the um, idea is that we have created really this balance between preserving the natural environment and creating necessary housing um, and neighborhoods for people that live here year round. This is a, actually a very similar um, property, a neighborhood that we built uh, a couple of years ago and it's modeled on the same exact um, neighborhood and design that we're about to construct again. and gives you an idea of um, what we um, what we have excuse me, what we have in mind. As you can see, these, these homes um, are accessible. So universal design is a component that we utilize in all our design so that people can age in place. And there are no thresholds going into the homes. There are bedrooms on each of these in each of these apartments, regardless of whether they're one, two, or three bedrooms. Um, and they're very energy efficient. So we, we, uh, we design and build these homes to be super insulated. And uh, that means that we have nine inches of insulation, triple glazed windows, airtight construction, and we're able to use um, heating and ventilation systems that are appropriately sized. And, um, me. Um, appropriately sized and um, are much uh, less energy, there's much less energy consumption in terms of their, uh, their use. Um, we have also included, as you saw in that picture before, um, accessibility in terms of the access to these homes as well. One of the other features that we've been including in all that we do is um, really caring for the, the water. Uh, we live on an island, obviously, and, and we have a sole source aquifer. Um, so uh, the quality of, of the groundwater is extremely important. We have many, many um, coastal ponds, estuaries, that are becoming more and more compromised by um, nitrogen from, uh, from the septic systems of homes um, on the uh, shores of the of these um, ponds and the uh, the coastline, so we have been starting to use innovative um, technologies that decrease the nitrogen output from septic systems, and we've been starting to integrate them in all of the neighborhoods that we are uh, building. This one here is a small neighborhood of eight homes, single-family homes, ownership homes, um, with solar panels. So similar to Sandy, we try to achieve zero net possible homes. And, um, but we're also looking to make sure that the groundwater and our estuaries are protected. Um, so we've been able to decrease nitrogen um, dramatically through um, carbon filtration systems, essentially, that um, filter out a lot of the, the nitrogen uh, that's created from septic systems. One other um, kind of model that we've been working on um, has been to really try and work with um, our aging population. So like in most of the country, we have a growing aging population. Um, and in many cases, they would like to stay, but need to downsize because they have too much home and they're trying to figure out how to make sense of all of that they have now. Um, so, one of the solutions that we came up with recently was purchasing this property, which you can see here, um, which had a main house where it says 299C and B, and then a guest house, 299A. And what we did was we purchased the entire property 
And then using the CLT ground lease model, uh, the owner retained his uh, guest house and we leased him a portion of the property. It was approximately an acre. And then we took the main house and converted that into two, three bedroom townhouses. It's essentially a duplex. And then again, leased the land underneath those two um, homes to the two new home, home buyers, uh, two families that uh, were income qualified. So this was a way for someone to take equity out of their property and enable them to continue to live here on the island as opposed to having to sell everything and move away. We're looking to do more of that. We're hoping with um, what's referred to as accessory dwelling units that we can create more options for people as they age and also at the same time um, provide year-round housing for our, um, our homeowners and residents here on the island. We have come up with um, some interesting ways of raising capital because in order to purchase properties, we have to have liquidity to do that. Um, and about four years ago, we came up with an idea of approaching some of our um, donors who were also interested in, in making investments, short-term investments. Um, so we created a bridge loan that we call the Make It Happen Fund. And essentially it was about a, a dozen, or excuse me, a half dozen investors that offered us lines of credit, which ranged from 100,000 to a million dollars, but combined were approximately $2 million that we've been drawing down um, in order to purchase properties in a timely way, because we've been purchasing properties from the market. Um, and that's enabled us to do much more. Uh, these were, philanthropic investors, they were only getting a uh, percent on their investments, but they were getting their principal and a, and a small um, interest back once we were able to raise the capital necessary to, um, to pay them back, which typically came in the form of grants or mortgages um, that we secured in order to do that. Um, so it's, it's enabled us to, to purchase many different properties. Um, now over the past four years, we've probably purchased half a dozen properties and, um, and we're continuing to do that and partner with others. We also have created a, um, another fund called the MV Future Financing, which is actually based on an idea that we found uh, in Seattle called the Seattle Future Fund where we're creating a longer term fund, kind of a mortgage um, for, uh, that we have offered our investors two and a half percent for 10 years in order to purchase the um, inn that we are now leasing to the hospital. So it was a way for us to engage people who were interested in investing directly into their community um, and receiving a slightly lower rate of return, but nonetheless, um, a reasonable rate. And working with one of our local um, banks, we were able to, who are currently servicing that loan, um, we were able to make that possible. So it's one of the ways that we found um, that, one of the many different ways that we found to raise the capital necessary to make these, um, these projects work. And like Sandy, we, we rely on a multitude of different sources of funding. Um, so from private investors um, and donors, to towns um, and grants that they offer, as well as state financing and, um, and soft debt that's offered uh, through the, the various um, agencies at the state level. So I think that's all I have to offer. This is um, a neighborhood, well actually two neighborhoods that we, we completed last year, we did the ribbon cutting. Um, I, I did, uh, I'd like to mention that we have been using uh, similar designs. So some of the duplexes, which fit well within the uh, context of our, our small neighborhoods um, have been repeated over and over again. And we're perfecting those designs, but utilizing them over so that we don't have to redesign every time out. Um, and in some cases, repurposing the existence. Thank you very much. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Let's see. 
Thank you very much, Philippe. You're welcome. That's, um, so many interesting things that you were talking about. Um, I think we have a lot to discuss. Um, maybe could you? Oh yeah. There we go. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, I think it's quite amazing what you both have been able to achieve in, in the past years, especially uh, uh, in the current climate um, of real estate. I recently read an article that said that, and that's in Europe, uh, in the Netherlands, that if you haven't bought a home now and you don't have rich parents, you've actually kind of missed the, the opportunity to ever own a home. Um, I can imagine that on the on an island on the islands um, that both of you live, that's more true than anywhere else. Um, so uh, you're offering this opportunity to people, and do you see, uh, Sandy? Do you see do you see possibilities to expand the CLT at the moment? And how would you think that that would be the best way to go about that? Uh, do you mean by expand that, that we will continue to uh, grow? Oh, yeah. Oh, for sure. And yeah. you know, it's interesting that, that somebody commented that if you haven't bought a home, then you've missed the boat because, you know, almost everything in our lives has been plotted out through policy, through lobbyists, through economic policy, through you know, social policy, et cetera. So I don't actually believe that. I think it's a matter of will. You know, like I said, do we really have to say that somebody is working a crucial job in order to be worthy of housing? I don't think so, you know? Um, it, it's, it's a matter of will, what we would, what we'd like to do. But, but yeah, I, um, you know, after, after a few decades, you know, find um, just, I'm not a very uh, gregarious or, or extroverted person, right? And people always say, if you wanna be a good fundraiser or this, you've gotta be all of those things. But what I find is that our work tends to speak for itself. And so we make relationship with people and being gifted land has been huge, but, but land in an area that's being really, really heavily gentrified. And as Philippe kept saying, you know, this is a global pressure as well as just a, a, a regional pressure. People come in with a lot of money and the people living here who need to work for a living make low wages. So that gap just keeps getting larger and larger. But by making relationship and acquiring land and getting donations and all of that, you know, we can make it happen. But I, I still keep coming back to the fact is, you know, it's all about, it's all about policy. Like it's uh, in our tax code in the, in the US, it's advantageous for somebody who has a large tax appetite to purchase a piece of property, watch that property, you know, go up in value. And when it reaches the right one, gift it to a nonprofit, and then they, can collect the tax benefit from that. But we could just as well have policy that says a certain amount of land in every community is made available for people, you know, who aren't interested in speculating in, in real estate, for instance. Anyway, so policy, 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 it's all about that. Do you feel like you're able to influence policy from the COP movement? Oh, sure, you know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. Because, you know, we keep in touch with our um, US and state senators and our local Congress and uh, I mean, uh, council and all of that. So, so yeah, I think it's, it's a part uh, living in a democracy. I think it's, it's part of what um, our civic duty, you know, for lack of a better word, is to do is to be engaged at that level, because we are only living in an unjust world because we have created it through our policy. It's, it's not natural to live with injustice. It's just, it's, it's not a natural phenomenon. So that's my two cents on the whole. Have you missed the boat? Forget about it. Just missed it. 
whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I think that both of you are a big inspiration for showing that you can actually change the society, even if it is on a smaller scale, but can give an example to a larger scale. So that's, uh, I think, very inspiring. Um, so, um, Sandy, you especially mentioned also that um, the continuity of the CLT as an organization um, is quite uh, what may be one of the most stressful things. And I can imagine, of course, because you said, well, we have a 200 year commitment uh, or maybe even longer. Um, how do you make sure that your organization, um, yeah, like you said, is it policy based or is it, or is it more about fundraising? Or, and, and I mean, you have been able to exist for 30 years. So how, how have you been able to, uh, to, to survive so long? Well, you know, through a lot of determination and, and actually, you know, working sometimes without pay, you know, things that are so vision driven. I think we see that all around, you know, we are not, we're, we're, we're kind of outside of what the, um, you know, what the societal norms are. And so we're not selling real estate on speculation, but we are having to purchase it in the same market where people are. So almost everything we do um, puts us at an economic disadvantage. But that said, I think that we have to build on multiple levels of scale when we're looking at a CLT. One, we have to be well-trained. Um, we have to understand the politics, we have to understand the culture, we have to understand finance, there's a lot that you, you have to understand land use, you know, and so you're building a, a board that has a lot of knowledge and uh, you're also uh, building a membership around you so that the people, if something internally happens with your CLT, the people in your community are fighting for it, regardless of personalities, they are going to come, you know, and, and be there for you. Um, but I think establishing from the get go that you have to, you have to foresee that through rents and lease fees, and, you know, we've never been able to take a developer's fee. I know that some, some are able to do that, but we have not been. But you've got to set up a fee structure that feeds the CLT. You know, the, the oxygen mask, put it on yourself first. Uh, we kind of forget that, but we have to do that because our, our commitment is out 200 years and we don't ever want to put the CLT in a position where it has to make some very tough choices just because there are some uh, financial pressures. Um, I don't know if I'm saying that very well, but anyway, you're working on multiple levels at the, at the same time. And I always tell people, do not be afraid to make contact with the people who are the best in their field and ask him, them to work for you gratis. You know, ask them to give. Because one thing I find in the nonprofit world is almost the same attorneys, the, the same land use folks, they're all stressed because they've got all these nonprofits needing something from them. But why not break out into that world where they're, they're basically selling their services always to the wealthiest, um, tax accountants, uh, real estate attorneys, uh, land use professionals, surveyors, whoever they are, you know, find a way so that they can funnel some of that energy into your nonprofit. You're not going to be able to hire and pay for the best, but you can certainly benefit from inviting them into your world and helping you set your CLT up so it is really on a firm foundation. So that's, and especially of course, if they're also local, I imagine. Um, yeah. Or, so, you know, they just have to understand your state or your country's, you know, land use and, and laws and that. But, but you know, we've worked with, um, you know, attorneys out of uh, Minnesota, um, New York, you know, different places because they will have an expertise in co-ops that we, we absolutely need. And um, so we get it that way. Yeah, I really like the, the quote that you had from Meg Whitney and as you said, of course, your community is maybe probably your most important asset as a yeah. as CLT. And um, how do you, 
how do you um, is, do you see that as a, as a role of the CLT to actively involve the community? Oh, uh, I mean, it's why community is in our name, right? We're yeah. not a land trust, right? We're, we're actually a community land trust. And so recognizing the power and the, the strength of relationship between the land and the people and that, that mutual... <laughs> you know, beneficial society that we have, you know, we steward the land and the land stewards us. Um, and also, you know, the greater community looking out for us is, and for our best interest is, um, it's just crucial because, well, I don't know about other CLTs, but ours has never had enough money to do what we've done and yet we've done it. And so how do we do that? And I always think of relationships, relationships, relationships. And you know, I'm not really the, the best person to get along with all the time, but still, you know, I recognize relationships as important. Yeah. It's important, thank you. Uh, we also have some questions from the audience that I'll get to in a minute. I just wanted to also ask a question to Philippe. And what I really thought was quite amazing was that you were so, you've been so innovative around the um, kind of integrating the natural environment and the um, human environment on the island. Um, was that something that was also policy based or was it mainly from uh, coming from the board from the community land trust or how did that work? Um, it, it really came from the need to realize that here on the island, um, as in many places, there needs to be this balance because we do cherish and, and it's critically cr cr important that we have open space and protected areas um, for people to enjoy as well. So it, it certainly came from a value based, um, but it was also practical in the sense that we were able to purchase larger pieces of property and utilize a, a small portion of it because we do more clustered uh, higher density housing in the form of these pocket, pocket neighborhoods and, um, and, and not necessarily physically use other portions of the property that we could sell um, and the, uh, our island's conservation organization could justify the purchase of those, um, that, prop, that portion of the property in the form of uh, conservation restrictions um, that helped us finance the, the acquisition. So it, it becomes both a practical and, and a value-based kind of um, goal in terms of how we, we utilize that. And um, we've done it many different times um, with this organization um, called the Land Bank. So um, we are actually continuing and, and um, working together to see if there are other property owners here on the island who would be interested in this type of partnership. Do you also see that maybe with the generational turnover and the aging uh, population, um, that there is also a possibility that um, some people would gift land into the uh, into the land trust? Certainly. I mean, we, we have been um, fortunate enough for people to, in the past, have given us land or put those in their wills. Um, but what we realized years ago um, was that we can't depend on um, public lands being um, transferred to us for the purposes of development or um, waiting for someone to donate land. If we want to make an impact uh, here on the island, we had to really get involved in uh, trying to find market-based solutions in terms of properties that were available um, that we could finance and make sense of. Um, in most cases, those involve what they call a discounted or bargain sale where uh, someone is selling the property for less than the full market value. And the difference between the appraised value and the, the value of the, the, the sale price is uh, essentially a tax deductible donation. So that tax benefit does figure into um, the sale price. And we've been able to successfully secure properties um, with that um, technique. Um, but yeah, we have done a lot more um, because of our ability to, to purchase properties um, that are, are being sold on the market. I can imagine that it's also uh, a role of yours then to educate 
impact investors around the possibilities of, or do you not see it that way? It is. I'm, I mean, it's it's a growing area, of, and we we've found it to be tremendously successful. So we have increased the amount of homes that we've been able to create over the past five years because of our Make It Happen Fund. Um, otherwise, we would be going to a, a conventional bank loan acquisition loan, and it's fairly expensive um, and time consuming. Whereas these uh, lines of credit that we're able to utilize. Um, can be done quickly and um, without a lot of overhead and cost in terms of closing them. Because, of course, in a very highly strong uh, real estate market, you have to be quite quick at uh, buying. Uh, yeah. It's, yeah, you can just imagine. And now, especially, I mean, people are buying property sight unseen in cash. But I guess it's also the relationship that people want to sell it. I, a lot of people would prefer to sell it. To right. Choice. So what we have there are people who have lived here who have seen this and want to make it um, possible for other people to live here year round. And for that reason have worked with us and have reached out to us and asked if we could purchase their property at a discount, or in some cases they would even donate. Um, so yeah, there are those people who, who see this and have seen it because they've lived here for generations um, and want to do something um, in terms of providing uh, for, for the legacy of, you know, their, their property and, and their family. Thanks. I have a question from, uh, for both of you from the audit, from the participants. Um, do you come up, up against not in my backyard pushback for, from your communities? How do you handle it? So. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, there's always pushback. Um, in the beginning, you know, this is when we were first beginning, uh, I would say we were the most hated uh, organization on the island. And I've still not seen anything quite close to it. Uh, we unleashed a, a hate mob that was just it was uh, shocking actually and puzzling. And, um, you know, we tried, you do all the same thing, right? Confrontation, uh, lack of confrontation, trying to put facts out there, you know, all, all, all the standard. But eventually I learned to just hear that they were really, really, really afraid. And I thought, I can't actually listen anymore because their fear about what we're doing and what we are actually doing are worlds apart. So I just put my head down and I got, you know, I mean, they had gone to the governor and all these places. So there was a lot of politics involved, but anyway, we just put our heads down and we just did what we set out to do. And once we manifested what we were doing, really it changed it changed the the whole response to us and i don't know i think everybody has to find their way there are always people in a community that have you know made relationship with somebody maybe the loudest person um you know study nonviolence. um you know get make sure that you've got a really good project um make sure that when you're listening the fears that they're talking about, if they really are something that you can do about and that you can see that, oh yeah, I didn't really see it from that perspective. Maybe we should make this change. I mean, you know, do all your due diligence, but, but yeah, I think uh, people just have that fearful reaction to new things. And sometimes we are the ones that are the, on the end of that. Absolutely. Yeah, I would just add that, um... We, we deal with that as well. Um, one of the things community land trusts are, however, are local. And these are people that really truly care and know about their community. We live here, we grow our kids here. You know, we, we, we participate in all aspects of our community. So when we do what we do, we pay a particular attention and care to how we do it. So whether it's site planning or the homes that we create, we're really, paying special attention to how that fits into the existing neighborhoods um, and towns that we work in. 
Um, and that comes through. People see that and they appreciate that. They don't, doesn't necessarily mean that they want it next door, but um, they do understand and appreciate the quality of what we do and the care that we put into it. Um, good models go a long way in terms of creating um, community support. Um, and it takes time. It takes you know years of showing that you can do this and you can do it well for people to get on board. Um, we also have a technique of talking to neighbors individually so we can listen to their particular concerns instead of gathering a large group of people, which typically is, uh, is the form that uh, these permits are issued under, you know, special permits require that everyone be notified and, and be able to say their say. So we find that getting out in front of that and speaking with neighbors one-on-one -on -one can be very helpful and we can hear from them and we can make adjustments that in some cases makes a difference, but it's yeah. hard. So, you know, NIMBY is always gonna be part of everything that we do. I can hear, but it's that's. I think that's really good. It's like listening, um, talking to people individually, and also listening to their fears. And but yeah, in the end, just showing that you're able to um, to do it. And uh, I, I guess that in a lot of ways, you're probably also one of the most loved organisations on the island. So, um, so I have another question here. So, what type of CLT education do you provide for leaseholders so that they feel part of the work and not just tenants? Well, let's see, we, we do a lot. So we typically start about a year, maybe a year and a half uh, before uh, we start building and we gather people together. We go through, you know, what they're getting involved with. Uh, sometimes we'll do a once a month meeting, sometimes every two weeks and we gather the, the group that's going to form the co-op together. And we, uh, one of the things we do is we invite um, other people in who have already lived in a CLT house uh, so that they can discuss things together. Uh, we uh, accept design, um, you know, sort of changes to, to a degree from those who have applied. Um, we work together usually for about eight months building. So everybody gets to know each other there. And uh, we offer courses on decision-making, household budgeting, understanding a co-op budget, that kind of thing. We, we do a lot uh, with each other. And because again, we're trying to create a, a very strong and grounded uh, culture so that if co-ops along the way have problems, they can reach out to each other. Um, you know, there's, there's enough, enough localized knowledge uh, that is grounded in what we're doing that they can make themselves available. Yeah. I would just add to that. Um, we, we often um, build little pocket neighborhoods of, uh, of homes and they, um, by their very nature need a homeowner association or a group that is gonna oversee the common improvements. So septic wells, roads, those type of things, um, as well as a way and a forum for communicating various things that might come up. So that's something that we do um, before we ever sell any of the homes um, is, is to convene and work with um, the home buyers in, in that way in, in actually setting up the meetings providing um, bylaws, policies and procedures so that they can um, have a starting place. Doesn't mean that they don't, they can't change these policies, but um, it's a place of, to, a, a place of departure for them. Um, and then we, of course, are there as a, as a CLT forever. <laughs> we're, we're gonna be part of um, the, their, their home ownership experience. Um, and so we provide that ongoing support. Um, and we have helped home, homeowners um, from losing their homes due to foreclosure by stepping in and working with their lender um, to avert um, something that, that potentially could have um, you know, uh, resulted in them losing their homes. So this is really an ongoing commitment that we have as all CLTs do. 
to not just um, creating homeownership opportunities, but ensuring that to the extent that we can, um, our homeowners are gonna be successful. And there's a number of homeowners in the board as well. Are they elected or how does that work? Yeah, ours are elected. Mm -hmm. And uh, how many are there? Are there number, a number of boards or is it just one board for, for the CLT? Well, we have one CLT board and then we have, um, you know, the separate co-op boards. Okay. Yeah. So, but for the CLT, uh, you know, we have, we can have anywhere between six and 15 uh, members on our board, depending on a project we're doing or what expertise we need. And usually a third or more are, are existing CLT uh, homeowners or, or lessors. Yeah. And, and how does that work with you? Um, so yeah, we, we actually did have a classic CLT board composition when we first started. Um, and we have since changed. We, we went from a board of 21. Um, and that was really, really driven by the fact that we have six towns. Um, and we, we realized as we were growing that we needed to have a smaller board um, and really grow our, our um, committees. Um, because we do need the committees. We do need staff interfacing and, and providing recommendation to the board. But we needed to have a more efficient um, way of, of making decisions, business decisions. So um, our board still reflects um, the diversity in our community, including our homeowners, um, but it, it's not that, um, it's not a membership-based organization and it doesn't have the tripartite um, uh, representation that most CLTs do um, by design. It, it is intentional in terms of how we, re um, we recruit and, um, uh, bring new board members on, um, and we do now have uh, term limits. So it's, you know, as many CLTs, we've taken um, what works and um, we've evolved in, in terms of what uh, we've had to do in order to um, to create more efficiencies for our organization. Um, Rachel is sending, my colleague Rachel is sending me some of the questions from the Q&A. I'm not sure if we'll be, I see that there's about 20 now, but I don't think we'll be able to answer them all. But she sent another question that said, uh, for both of you, do you have regular turnover and how do you determine the resale value of the home ownership units? Um, we have some turnover, but it's not very regular uh, because we live on an island and because the real estate market is as it is. If people live here, they typically, you know, some people stay in their house 30 years uh, or more. Um, so, but when we do have turnover, our, our uh, resale formula is quite simple. There is a, uh, we're a limited equity co-op. So there's basically a 3% simple interest equity gain on the original membership fee. And, and that's it. Uh, there's some, in the ground lease, it, it talks about, you know, doing improvements. Improvements are, are have a, a cap on them, you know, of several thousand dollars. Um, but yeah, it's, it's quite simple. Uh, we adjust for CPI if, if you know, it's over that uh, 3%, but. Thanks. Um, we have, um... We've seen uh, renters who have purchased some of our homes, which is wonderful. Um, so there's been that um, opportunity. Most of our homeowners, however, have not sold. So although we've been only in existence for 15 years, we've had very few turnover. Um, and that is frankly due to the fact that to go from a home that's probably valued between 250 dollars and $300,000 um, to 800, 900 a million dollars is, is really not um, possible. So it unfortunately means that people have to leave um, if, if they're looking to, to move uh, from their CLT home. We, um, we have a formula, an index-based formula. Uh, so when someone goes to sell, in fact, every year we, we calculate that based on the, the increase in the area median income. So essentially our 
um, our sale price is, um, is appreciating um, at the same rate that people's incomes generally are um, increasing here. So it's really pegged on that. So uh, in theory, the cost of the house for someone at the same income in 10 years will be uh, relatively the same. Um, not in terms of the price, but in terms of what they're able to purchase it for um, because of their increase in, in income. So that's how we gauge it. And it's actually, it's a very simple formula in the sense that we can calculate it down to the dollar and we can share that with our, our town assessor so that they can value the property for purposes of, of uh, property taxes accurately on an yeah. annual basis. A lot higher than, yeah. So also another question for both of you is, uh, how do you determine, I mean, I can imagine there's, there could be quite a long waiting list. Uh, how do you determine who gets to buy the house or rent? Um, is it a waiting list or is it uh, a different system? Uh, we don't keep waiting lists because we don't have, uh, we don't have enough turnover really waiting lists. Yeah. If we're going to, if, if we know that a share in a co-op is coming up, um, you know, we'll put that word out there. And otherwise, if we're going to do a new project, we advertise uh, typically in English and Spanish because those are the two primary uh, languages here. Uh, if somebody needs another um, translation, we have, uh, you know, we can do that. And so we advertise, we still put up posters because we live in a small rural place and word of mouth. Then we accept applications. We look at things like, you know, income, credit history, uh, debt, um, that kind of thing. And then we get a list of qualified applicants and we do it on a first come first serve. We used to try and do all kinds of things like, do you live without indoor plumbing? You got so many points, et cetera. But, but just became kind of complicated. So now we just do it. You're qualified. It's first come, first serve. We uh, invite people in to understand the process. Along the way, some people self-select out. Others are there. And then we, we go from there. So we try and you know, get word out uh, through as many places as we can so that we can catch as many people as we need to. And what if they are like, do they have any, um, is there any way in which you look at the way that people are maybe linked to the island or were born on the island or that kind of, no? No, we have a two year residency requirement. People have to have lived here a couple of years to know that they can one, live in the dark in the winter, uh, to be able to earn their living, uh, know that they would like to live in a place that's served by fairies. See, people get all starry eyed in the summertime when they come here. <laughs> but, but anyway, the winter's a whole different thing. So no, we but we don't ask about, um, we don't give points for, for other types of things like that. So we have probably um, 10 applicants for every opportunity. Um, and those are qualified applicants, not just people who are submitting applications, but people who've actually been qualified either for a mortgage or um, for rental. Um, so there's a, there's a tremendous need um, by comparison to the opportunities that are actually here and offered on a regular basis. Um, we do. Um, when we have new construction or renovation, uh, we have a public process of advertising, both in Portuguese, because we have a lot of Brazilian, we have a large Brazilian population here, community, and in English, obviously. So that is something that we work with our um, actually local housing authority who uh, does this on a regular basis. They also provide us with our, our rental property management. And um, we comply with um, state and federal fair housing laws. So that requires that, um, various um, marketing uh, measures be put into place in terms of uh, notifying of, of opportunities um, that we um, that we obviously have to income qualify them and so forth. If it's ownership, they have to get um, uh, pre-approved from banks for mortgages. And then we uh, run a lottery 
um, which basically means your name has to get pulled out of a hat. Um, there are in some cases allowances for what they call local preference. So if you're coming from a particular town or if the, if the um, neighborhood or home is located in a particular town and that town has funded it um, or permitted it, we can provide up to 70% of the um, opportunity, you know, home ownership opportunities or rental opportunities to people living, working in that town. Um, but otherwise, no, we, we can't limit um, who can apply. By virtue of the fact that people have to either pay a mortgage or pay rent, they need to have a job, um, which means they have to have gainful employment on the island. Um, so for the most part, we, we don't, we've really never seen, frankly, people who come from off island to live here. Um, but we do have a need, a growing need to, um, uh, of our schools, of our hospitals, uh, of our employers in general, to be able to find um, employees. So attracting and retaining employees is critically important. Um, and, uh, and that's one of the biggest issues in terms of uh, employment here on the islands. You can offer them a job, but if they don't have housing, um, then, then they end up not taking it. And uh, you as an employer, I mean, that, that's, that's what we're finding right now, especially with seasonal employment now. It's just becoming, you see signs everywhere. There's just no one who can live here, obviously, because they don't have the housing. And you have a lot of people who are working in education or in healthcare. Or... Oh, yes, we, we have a hospital here. It's the largest nonprofit employer. And second to that is our school system. And uh, they are having, they are struggling uh, because there's turnover, especially with the schools. You have older employees who are retiring and the, uh, the ability to attract and retain young teachers uh, is, is very, very challenging. So that's something that we're starting to do is, is again, partner with these nonprofits um, to see if we can find solutions. So we come in and provide um, the housing, you know, the actual uh, nuts and bolts of making these these housing solutions possible. And then they come in and do what they do, whether it's their clients in the case of uh, supportive housing for homeless um, residents here on the island, um, or we have a group that we're working with right now, an autism group on the island who's creating a center. We're coming and doing what we do well, which is um, creating these home ownership and mental opportunities. Um, I have another question for both also. I think it's quite very relevant, of course, for the islands. Like, how do you deal with the short-term rentals situation? Um, we won't engage at all with short-term rentals. I mean, we... What if, what if one of the occupants wants to uh, sublet? No, not, a, not allowed. I, uh -huh. I, I know it, it seems so attractive to people, but, but it just, it puts further pressure on our entire system. So we just don't do any of it. Um, not, not even if they desperately come begging, um, just don't do it. Yeah, yeah we, uh, the, the standard ground lease only, in our case only allows for, um, it requires 11 months of, of primary residency. So people, unless they're given, unless they're extenuating circumstances, they're moving for some reason for a short period of time, um, that uh, if they do rent it, they would have to be rented year round. There's no, absolutely no short-term rental um, provision in, in our ground leases. Um, and yeah, it's, it's become, it's really one of the, the main reasons why we're, we're losing so many market-based um, year round rental opportunities or seasonal for that matter, because um, now everyone has a platform for renting a room to a home. Um, and the state has now instituted a, a tax on short-term rentals. Um, and, the, and the towns are enjoying some revenues from that uh, to defray the, the costs incurred from, from the visitors here to the island. Um, but it's not going directly to housing. <clears throat> Well, um, one of the questions that I was really wondering about is what specific, um, in what specific way is the Community Land Trust uh, an answer actually to, to the climate emergency that we're dealing with, especially on islands? Um, you know, I feel like right now, climate disruption and issues around climate are 
uh, front and center for us. And single family residential building is one of the big contributors. Not, not the biggest, but it's, it's one of them. So I just feel like even though it costs more, we just have to, every, everything we do, you know, our rainwater collection, our, all of our water-wise fixtures, uh, net zero building, um, zero scaping, you know, whatever we do for, that are best practices right now for addressing, you know, something around climate, is our responsibility looking at embodied energies, um, lessening the amount of concrete, all of that. We, we just, we're immersed in it and our daily lives need to respond to it. So just part of, part of what we do. It's the water we swim in right now. Yeah, so what we, what we started to do is um, work with GIS uh, geographic information systems to start understanding suitability on the island in terms of various properties that um, don't have or are less susceptible to, to climate change um, and are also better placed in terms of public uh, services, utilities, and so forth. Um, so utilizing that technology um, and matching that up with availability, with what's actually available on the market, um, we're able to start making sense and prioritizing properties in a way that we hadn't in the past, um, where we were just really responding and reacting to what was available. Um, we, um, like um, Lopez, uh, have put a premium in terms of uh, high performance um, construction so that our, our carbon footprint is uh, drastically reduced in terms of how we build um, when we build new. When we purchase existing, we try to integrate as much as we can. Um, that's you know, feasible uh, in terms of upgrading to the 21st century. Um, but yeah, absolutely. You know, affordable housing doesn't mean cheap housing. It means housing that is affordable for the long term. And that means um, what you um, experience as uh, in terms of upkeep, maintenance, and energy costs. So um, the, the, I mean, there's two different things really going on. One is the kind of the, this model of land tenure um, and community ownership in that. And then there's the broader question of, of, um, of climate change. And we as islands are typically more susceptible to that as well because of, of, of shifts in, um, in, in storm patterns um, and frequency of um, really damaging um, natural events. Uh, so hurricanes are certainly not new to us. Um, we have we've been graced to not have any major hurricanes uh, in in the past a decade or so, but um, the frequency is increasing, and we are uh, certainly very very exposed to that threat. Yeah, I like that. Uh, affordable housing isn't cheap housing. You probably uh, the CLT model actually. Um, provides more room to create uh, sustainable housing, I could imagine, um, and especially as, as the, both of you have shown. Um, I think the other big issue, of course, of this time is the growing inequality um, that we're all dealing with. Um, I mean, more, some of course, a lot more than others, um, but um, that's one of the reasons that I've always been attracted to community land trusts um, is because globally um, there is less and less uh, possibility for for people um, and especially uh, members of the BIPOC community to be able to um, find um, affordable housing or land or be uh, be able to farm. Um, and this is, of course, a growing problem. Do you have any more ref any reflections on that? I have a As lot, final. a lot of reflections on that. Oh. <laughs> uh, we only have four minutes, though. So. <laughs> deep shame, right? That we are all living on land that was stolen and bloodied and all of that. I think that one of the things CLTs do is they honor the fact that land should be removed from speculation and people should have access to it. And there's a lot more to say about that, but um, 
yeah, I think it's a, it's a big, deep ocean that we need to wade into and, and start to make right. And I think CLTs are a really excellent tool in that toolbox to, to try and um, address some of those issues. So I'll just leave it at that for now. Do you want to add to that? Yeah, I, I would just say that um, home ownership clearly um, has been shown um, provides a way for people to um, to get generational wealth, um, and it's it's critically important that that be available to to everyone. Um, and what we have found, as, as Sandy mentioned, is that we have a much higher percentage of people. Um, and, and who are racially diverse and economically, uh, typically of lower income, who are able to either become homeowners or renters um, and can afford that. So what's been interesting is for instance, this past year where a lot of people have been struggling um, to make you know, their mortgage or pay their rent um, because they are paying um, no more than 30% of their income typically for ownership and rental um, cost, housing costs, a lot, we have not seen the same um, delinquency in, in payments, uh, you know, either homeowners paying their mortgages or, or tenants paying uh, their, their rent um, because they're not strapped. They're not paying 50% of their income towards home, um, home, home housing costs. So I think that's, that's a tribute to, to the, you know, the fact that we are able to provide um, people with um, that kind of housing security um, that over time will um, provide access for them um, in terms of um, opportunities for themselves and their family and their children. So it's, it's critically important here. Um, we, have, we have a very diverse community, both seasonal and, and um, year round. Um, and we have a, a disproportionately higher percentage um, of people of color and, and um, we have actually won the first federally recognized Indian tribe here on the island, uh, the Aquino Wampanoag tribe, um, who, um, who have their homeland here and um, have been here since time immemorial, um, who, have, who have really been, um, you know, continue to be uh, stewards of the land. So, um, and are very much part of our community. So we, we learn from all aspects, you know, we have very individual, unique towns, and one federally recognized Indian tribe, and um, and they're all important in terms of our community and keeping it whole. Thank you, thank you both very much. We've come to uh, half past. Um, I just want to thank you both, Sandy and Philippe, very much for for sharing your stories with us all, and I hope it's been inspiration to everybody who's joined us. Thank you also very much for joining us and um, hope to see everyone back at the next CLT Roundtable. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Take care.